What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. Oh, and holy crap, welcome to 2023. How absolutely crazy is that? 2023? What? Wow, that, that really is weird. Happy New Year. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday season. I hope you got to spend it with the people who are most important to you. I hope you got to relax and eat good food. And most importantly, I hope you were able to ring in the new year safely and happily. I had a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much for asking. Also had a great New Year's. My family always spends it eating snacks and playing board games and watching the Times Square like ball drop presentation. Are you talking about Dick Clark's New Year's Rockin' Eve? It's what my family always did growing up and now it's a tradition that I'm having a lot of fun passing down to my kids. Anyways, if this is your first time seeing my face, Hello! my name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on some makeup. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, please consider subscribing and liking this video. That kind of stuff really helps out the channel a lot and I appreciate you so much for doing so. However, if in hearing what this channel is all about, you've decided that you'd rather not stick around, that's perfectly fine. It's not for everyone and I'm very much aware of that. So if you'd still like to hear the story just with me and the makeup removed from the equation, feel free to check out the description box where I've taken the time to list out some other creators who have cover today's story in a way that perhaps you might enjoy more. I did that for you. You are welcome. And now that I've got all of that stuff out of the way, let's go ahead and get into today's case. All right, so the roadmap, if you will, to the horrible events of today's case actually started to take shape in the unlikeliest of places. In fact, a lot of people believe that the events of today's case only took place because of one specific and terrible television program. A television program so bad that TV Guide magazine called it, quote, the worst spectacle in the history of television, unquote. A television program that ran for 27 seasons with almost 6,000 episodes from its pilot episode on September 30th, 1991, to its finale on July 26th, 2018. A television program whose bread and butter was quite literally the exploitation of its guests' trauma, secrets, sex lives, and or relationship woes. A television program whose live studio audiences, hoops and hollers, likely awoke many an unsuspecting television viewer who'd fallen asleep watching something perfectly normal, only to be jarred awake, if not by all the swear word bleeping, then certainly by the infamous war cry of the show's spectators. That's right, today we're talking about a case that is widely known across the internet as the Jerry Springer murder. Which of course you already knew given the title and the thumbnail of this video, but if you could just humor me for a second and pretend you were surprised, that'd be great. So, did you guys know that the Jerry Springer shell actually was not always the hot steaming pile of toxic waste that we all know and hate it for being? Yeah, it actually started out with the intention of being a thought-provoking talk show centered around politics and social justice issues. Because Jerry Springer, by trade, was actually a politician prior to his talk show. He started in politics in 1968 when he was in his mid twenties, when he served as a campaign advisor for Robert F. Kennedy. From there, he served as a member of the city council in Cincinnati, Ohio, before he actually served as the mayor of Cincinnati in 1977. After his stint as mayor, he moved from politician to political commentator for a local Cincinnati news station where he remained until the early nineties. Then in 1991, Jerry managed to parlay his political commentary into his very own show, The Jerry Springer Show. And his show was intended to discuss actual legitimate serious issues, but as I'm sure we all know, money makes the world go round. And unfortunately at first, Jerry's show wasn't pulling the ratings he and his producers 
needed to rake in the money that they were initially anticipating. So in the mid 90s, 94, 95 ish, they decided to revamp the show into the guttural abomination it's known as today. Even Jerry himself has stated before that the show had nary a redeeming quality to it. That is aside from the big ass paychecks it was earning him, I guess. And with the level of salaciousness seeming to determine the show's ratings, each episode was undoubtedly meant to be more shocking and appalling than the last. And with episodes like Big Busted Strippers, I'm sleeping with my brother, you slept with my husband and my sister, my wife is a pimp, and I married a horse. By comparison, the episode that's at the center of our story today actually comes across as pretty tame. Secret Mistresses Confronted, which was filmed on May 7th, 2000, was an episode of the Jerry Springer show that was meant to basically blindside people's partners with the devastating news that they were either cheating on them or leaving them for someone that they'd been cheating on them with. More or less, the point of the episode was to eviscerate some poor, unsuspecting person by completely obliterating their life, all while broadcasting the entire ordeal on national television and in front of a live studio audience. Disgusting. And one of the dysfunctional love triangles featured on this episode was comprised of 40-year-old Ralph Panitz, 52-year-old Nancy Campbell Panitz, and 45-year-old Eleanor Panitz. So what's the deal with the Panitzes? Who are they? What's going on with them? How did they find themselves slumming it on Jerry Springer, airing their dirty laundry for the whole world to see? Well, it all started in October 1997 when Ralph married Nancy. The two had met online and Ralph had actually moved from Germany to the United States in order to be with her. However, the two were only married for a whopping 15 months before they separated. And from what I could gather, most of those 15 months were really not all that happy. By the time they'd filed for divorce in early 1999, Nancy had taken out a restraining order on Ralph and Ralph had filed multiple domestic violence allegations against Nancy. Suffice it to say, they were kind of a toxic ass mess. Little did they know that things were just going to get, oh, so much worse. So they filed for divorce, which was ultimately granted and finalized in February of 99, by which time Ralph had already started to move on. Ralph met Eleanor, or Ellie, as she prefers to be called. He um, he met her the same year that he and Nancy were divorced. And Ellie's friends describe she and Ralph's relationship as a once in a lifetime love. And they refer to them as soulmates. They liked the same books. They liked the same movies. They had similar senses of humor. And Ellie was infatuated with Ralph pretty much right away. Her mother and sister, however, well, they were less impressed. Neither of them really liked Ralph all that much when they met him. They just kind of got a bad vibe from him. They thought he seemed like the, you know, kind of guy who could be possessive or maybe even violent. And Ellie's mother specifically was scared that if Ellie were to involve herself with Ralph, that he could even really hurt or kill her someday. And she did voice these concerns to her daughter, but they fell upon deaf ears. Ellie was far too obsessed with Ralph to possibly look at the situation objectively. Instead, she thought that maybe her mother was suspicious of Ralph because he was too handsome for her and that he was possibly just using her for citizenship. Because remember, Ralph was a German citizen at the time that all of this was taking place. Now, speaking of the beginning of their relationship, I'm unclear on the exact timeline of it all. I don't know for sure if it started after Ralph's divorce from Nancy. I don't know if, you know, it started while he and Nancy were just separated but not fully divorced yet. I don't know if it started while they were still together. I, I couldn't tell you. Beats me. What I can tell you though is that although Ralph was legally divorced from Nancy, he still bought back and forth romantically between she and Ellie for the better part of a year. And from what I could gather, the women did know 
that he was still involving himself with both of them. I mean, I don't think they liked it, but I'm pretty sure that they did both know that it was going on. And like I said, this went on for about a year. It wasn't until March of 2000 that Ralph decided to settle down and be with Ellie exclusively. They were married in a civil ceremony on St. Patrick's Day, but they kept their marriage a secret from Nancy, I guess out of fear over how she'd react, or maybe Ralph was going to keep stringing her along. I don't know. Regardless of the reason, the situation is just a big ass mess. And obviously not knowing that Ellie and Ralph had gotten married, Nancy continued to contact Ralph. And now that they were married, this really pissed Ellie off. Because I guess now, legally speaking, that was her man. But as luck would have it, a few weeks later, while watching TV, a solution to all of her problems seemed to just drop right into Ellie's lap. If someone out there is disrupting your relationship, call Jerry. So she called into the show, submitted her story, and lo and behold, the three Panitzes were invited on as guests. Maybe if she and Ralph could confront Nancy and, you know, humiliate her on national television, maybe then she would leave them alone once and for all. And I know what you're thinking. Why in the actual hell would Nancy agree to this? That's a valid question with quite a simple answer. She didn't. She was actually lured onto the show by Ralph and the producers under the guise that she and Ralph were going to be rekindling their relationship and that Ellie was going to be the one getting kicked to the curb. And this was a lie that Ralph committed to so fully that he actually spent the night and slept with Nancy in the hotel the production had put them up in the night before their episode was set to film. Yeah, this shit is a mess and we're just getting started. So morning rolls around, they're all getting ready and they head out to the studio. Now, I was unable to actually view the Panitzes segment. It seems to have been scrubbed from the internet, which is probably a good thing considering how this all turns out. But I was, thanks to the Wayback Machine, able to find a transcript of their appearance, which I will summarize for you right now. So their segment starts with Ellie and Nancy sitting on the stage while Jerry briefly summarizes their situation for the audience. He explains to them that Ellie had come on the show because she was desperate for Nancy to butt out of she and Ralph's lives, but that Nancy was on the show because Ralph had told her that he actually wanted to be with her and not with Ellie. And so to find out what's really going on, please welcome to the stage, Ralph. <laughs> Ralph rolls out to an uproar of booze from the audience as he walks on stage and kisses both Nancy and Ellie. Just the fact that these women were at each other's throats this whole time when, in my opinion, it is painfully clear that Ralph was purposefully instigating all this drama. Why? So he could feel wanted? Wow. Anyways, Ralph takes his seat and Jerry looks at him and he's like, so Ralph, two women both say you want them and not the other. What up? To which Ralph is like, oh, yeah, so um, I did bang Nancy last night, but it's totally not what you think. I only did it to keep her thinking that I still loved her because I was afraid that if she caught wind of what was really going on, that she wouldn't come on the show. And thankfully, Jerry, in response, asks the question that I'm sure we all have at this point, which is, um... Huh? So Ralph then takes this opportunity to stand up and proudly proclaim his love for Ellie right before he drops the bombshell on Nancy that the two of them were actually already married and had been for almost two months. And Jerry's like, yeah, well, you know, that's all fine and good, but it still doesn't like really explain why you had sex with Nancy last night. So Ralph goes on to say that Nancy had barricaded herself in her hotel room and that she was saying that if Ralph didn't come and see her, that she wasn't going to go on the show. So poor Ralph at like two in the morning had to just ugh, drag himself out of bed and go to Nancy's hotel room for just like a quick romp in the sack. And all this so that the next day on the show, he could tell her that he and Ellie were married now and that they wanted her to leave them alone. Now I'm no 
conflict resolution expert, but couldn't he have just told him that they were married that night in the hotel room and been done with the whole thing? You know, instead of sleeping with her just to get her to go on the show and prolong this whole thing and make it even messier? Like, am I alone in my confusion as to why the TV show had to be a part of this at all? It's giving, I'm desperate for the whole world to know that two women want me, right? So he did all of this. He put them through this whole rigmarole for a six minute TV slot on the trashiest of trash TV. His explanation for involving the show was that he thought if he humiliated Nancy on national television that maybe then she'd realize they were over for good. But if he wanted her to think that they were over, then why did he sleep with her like 12 hours earlier instead of just telling her it was over? The whole thing makes absolutely no sense. It is just so incredibly stupid, but I guess we'll just power thrill. From there, basically the rest of the segment was just the three of them arguing. Ellie and Ralph accused Nancy of stalking them. Nancy accused Ralph of living for all this drama and not actually wanting a peaceful monogamous life, which pissed Ellie off. So then she started like a studio wide chant calling Nancy old and fat. It was just, it was a mess. And then just as the tensions started to peak, Jerry looked at Nancy and he said like, look, he clearly does not want to be with you. And Nancy just walked off stage. No further screaming, no fists of flying, no whatever this is. <coughs> she just says, fine, whatever, and exits stage right or stage left. I, I don't know. Like I said, I only saw the transcript. I didn't see the actual episode. So let me go ahead, take my break throw on my lashes. And when we get back, we'll find out how things pan out with the panances. Spoiler alert, it ain't great. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so welcome back to the hot mess that is this story. Now, as I alluded to before the break, the show did not have a positive outcome for any of the panances, but you'd assume that it would have turned out particularly poorly for Ralph and Ellie, right? You know, given the revelation that Ralph had been with Nancy the night before, despite the fact that he was now married to Ellie. I don't know about you, but if I find out that my husband slept with someone else, I don't care what the reason is, baby, we ain't married no more. And it's as simple as that. But I guess that is just one of the many, many ways that Ellie and I differ because instead of leaving this man high and dry and alone, like he clearly deserved to be, she decided to look past her husband's infidelity and instead blame the Jerry Springer production crew for what he'd done. You know, cause the production company had put them all up in the same hotel. And the rule is that if a TV production crew puts you, your new wife and your ex-wife all in the same hotel, you have to sleep with your ex-wife. Like you actually don't have a choice to um, not do that and instead do literally anything else. So it obviously was not his fault. But even with her ability to overlook Ralph's cheating, he and Ellie still found plenty of other things to fight about over the weeks following the show's taping. And eventually they actually did end up briefly separating. Ellie moved out of the home that she shared with Ralph and she moved in with one of her friends. And Ralph, um, <laughs> what do you think Ralph did? Do you think maybe he did some soul searching and realized that he'd been terrible to these women and vowed to change his ways. Would you believe me if I said that is what he did? Hopefully not, because that is absolutely not um, what he did. Instead, he actually called up Nancy and got back together with her. Now, I really hate to make assumptions about that, which I do not know and cannot prove, but in my opinion, there was something that this man was doing to these women that was absolutely tanking their self-esteem. I cannot think of another reason why they would keep taking this awful man back. They have to have been so broken and so beaten down that they believed that he was the best they could do, which is really, really sad. Your significant other should build you up, not 
tear you completely down. But even after everything that he had put her through up to this point, Nancy still took him back. They rekindled their romance and they were planning on moving back in together. They even put a down payment down on a $116,000 home together. Well, Nancy put the money down with the intention of she and Ralph living in the home together. And for context, $116,000 would be almost $200,000 in today's money. So suffice it to say that Nancy expected this go round with Ralph to last. But surprise, surprise, barely even a month into this rekindled romance, Ralph started emailing Ellie again and begging her to take him back. And surprise, surprise, she did. And then she and Ralph, um, they moved into the house that Ralph and Nancy had been intending on moving into together. Yes, the very same house that Nancy had paid for. The audacity! Yep, Ralph, Ellie, and Ralph's nephew Marcus all moved into the house on Grand Cayman Road and Nancy moved out. But she wasn't planning on going down without a fight. Not this time. This time she took her grievances to court and filed a suit to have Ellie and Ralph removed from her home so that she could regain residence. And on top of that, she also requested a restraining order against Ralph, stating that he had chased her around the house with a knife, threatening to her and her family. I swear, just when you think that this whole situation can't get any more messy or dramatic, um, it does. I would say like what in the Jerry Springer is wrong with these people, but considering the fact that they actually went on Jerry Springer, I feel like the joke kind of loses its impact, you know? Now, Ralph tried to fight to keep the house on the grounds that Nancy was crazy and that she was stalking he and Ellie and just blah, 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 blah. But regardless of this argument on July 24th, 2000, a judge ruled in Nancy's favor. She was granted sole occupancy of the home as well as the restraining order she'd requested. A sheriff's deputy then escorted Ellie and Marcus to the home to gather their belongings. But because of the restraining order Nancy had on Ralph now, he was not allowed to return to the premises. So instead, while Ellie and Marcus went and and packed up all of their things, Ralph went to a local bar and he started just pounding drinks and stewing in his own rage. And I don't know what kind of like unholy sadistic zemblanity was at play here, but in some inexplicable and outrageous twist of fate, The same day that Nancy was given the house and the restraining order, the same day that Ralph found himself at this bar drowning his sorrows, July 24th, well, that just so happened to be the same day that he and Ellie and Nancy's episode of Jerry Springer aired. And what do you suppose that Ralph watched on TV at the bar while he was festering in his own fury? You guessed it. Because what better to do when you're, you know, furious than to torture yourself by watching a TV special dedicated to exploiting the very reason that you're furious. Sound logic. And as one might expect, by the time that the episode was over and Ralph was done drinking himself into oblivion, uh, his anger was inexplicable. He was supposedly so distraught that he actually left the bar and tried to um, punch his own ticket, if you will, by walking into traffic. However, when no cars hit him and he made it off the road unscathed, Ralph then decided to return to the house on Grand Cayman Street, despite the fact that he wasn't legally allowed to be there. And according to Ellie, when she and Marcus saw that Ralph had come back, rather than, I don't know, putting him in a car and taking him somewhere else. They instead brought him into the house that he wasn't allowed to be at, and um, they tucked him in to bed, you know, to sleep off the drunk while she and Marcus finished packing up the house. But then, out of nowhere, big fat bummer, Nancy shows up and throws a wrench into Ralph's nap time plans. So to avoid Ralph getting arrested for literally not even making it one whole day without violating the restraining order, Ellie and Marcus, again, according to Ellie, proceed to sneak him out a window with plans to pick him up later at a nearby 7-Eleven. Now, once Ralph has successfully snuck, snuck in, sneaked? Snuck. (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) Once Ralph has successfully snuck out of the house, still doesn't sound right. Marcus and Ellie grab the rest of their stuff, 
hop in the car and make their way towards the 7-Eleven to pick him up. But they didn't make it very far because just as they got to the end of the street, Ellie stopped the car and told Marcus that he needed to go back to the house because she was afraid that Ralph was going to go back and kill Nancy, which I feel like is an oddly specific fear, but okay. So Marcus does what he's told. He heads back to the house to check on Nancy while Ellie starts driving around the neighborhood looking for Ralph. But when Marcus got back to the house, he couldn't get the door to open. It wasn't locked. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that when he started to open it, it seemed as though there was something blocking it or barricading it on the other side. So panicked by the idea that Nancy was possibly in danger, Marcus ran to a neighbor's house and had them call 911. And I don't know about you, but um, I'm confused. I don't understand how we went from, hey, we'll meet you at the 7-Eleven in a few minutes to, oh my God, I think he's gonna kill her? The math ain't math -ing. And the weirdness does not stop there because supposedly while all this was going on at the house with Marcus, Ellie just happens upon Ralph meandering around the street. She gets him in the car and then they proceed to drive off without Marcus. They just left his ass at what turned out to be a very gruesome crime scene. Minutes after the neighbor called 911 to report Marcus's supposed concerns, police discovered the body of 52-year-old Nancy Campbell Panitz, savagely beaten and strangled in the kitchen of her home. One of the officers that was on the scene described it as one of the worst crime scenes he'd ever seen. There was blood everywhere and Nancy had been beaten so severely that she was almost unrecognizable. Not to mention that there was also a literal shoe print on her face, meaning that Ralph, or I'm sorry, whoever had done this, had likely stomped on Nancy's face, which to me seems pretty personal, but what do I know? There was also a footprint next to Nancy on the floor, which police made sure to document as evidence. And as they started canvassing the neighborhood and speaking to some of Nancy's neighbors, a pretty clear picture of what had happened there started to take shape. According to Nancy's lawyer, Ralph had not been the only one that was angered by Nancy's victory in court that day. Apparently Ellie also had quite a volatile reaction and both she and Ralph had to be forcibly removed from the court by bailiffs out of concern for Nancy's safety. Then at around 5.30 that evening, Nancy returned home where she briefly encountered Ellie and Marcus as they were leaving. Around 6 p.m., a neighbor reported reported hearing a man and woman shouting from inside Nancy's house. And then it was about 7.30 when Nancy's body was found. So you wanna know what I think happened? I hope so, cause I'm gonna tell ya. But before I do, just a reminder that this is just a theory based solely on my opinion. It cannot be substantiated by fact. So please do your own research and form your own opinions. Okay, so I think that Ellie and Ralph were like, Soup's pissed that Nancy won her house back and that they had to vacate. I think they planned together to kill Nancy. And I think, are you ready for this? I think that they planned to frame Marcus for it. Why else would they send him back to discover her body? Why else would they just ditch him after they met back up? Why is it that Ellie was all of a sudden overcome with the immense fear that Ralph was going to kill Nancy. And then how did Ellie just happen upon Ralph wandering around the street just in time to get him in the car and get the hell out of Dodge after she'd gotten rid of Marcus, but before the cops showed up? I think their plan was to get Marcus back to the house so that Ellie could pick up Ralph and they could flee leaving Marcus to deal with the repercussions. It was documented that Marcus didn't really like Nancy either. And I think Ralph and Ellie were banking on police suspecting him for her murder because he was at the crime scene. I think they figured he'd go down for the murder, Ralph would get away scot-free, and then they could go live happily ever after finally free from Nancy. And how much do you wanna bet that they would have moved back into that Grand Cayman house at the first opportunity they got. Luckily for Marcus, thanks to the statements from Nancy's neighbors, coupled with Ralph and Nancy's well-documented tumultuous history, it did not take long for them to rule Marcus out and set their sights on Ralph. The problem was, 
he and Ellie had already booked it out of Florida and were heading towards Maine, which is where Ellie's originally from. Authorities believe that their ultimate goal was to get Ralph to the German embassy in Canada where he could seek refuge. And they think they were trying to get Ellie, who by the way, is Native American. They think they were trying to get her to a reservation where, and I'm not like super knowledgeable about this. So if I get it wrong, I am sorry. But I think if she were to make it to a reservation, it would at the very least make it more difficult for her to be prosecuted for any crimes. Meanwhile, back at home, Ellie's family was actually concerned that she hadn't so much as fled with Ralph as she had been taken by Ralph as a hostage. But Ellie and Ralph maintained that the only reason they left town was so that Ralph wouldn't get in trouble for violating the restraining order. They were under some weird assumption that Nancy was trying to have Ralph deported. And the whole restraining order thing to me seems like a massive overreaction considering the typical consequences for breaking a restraining order I don't really think are that severe, which is a problem in and of itself, but That's a conversation for a different day. But you mean to tell me that they were trying to drive 1,600 miles to avoid a few days in jail and maybe a fine? I don't buy it. They were on the run for four days before they found out that someone had killed Nancy when Ellie's father called them to inform them. Okay. And because they totally had nothing to hide, they made their way back to Florida and turned themselves in on July 28th, 2000. It definitely wasn't because they caught wind that police were closing in on them. Yeah, no, it for sure was not that. So Ralph and Ellie walk into the police station and they're like, oh my God, are our faces red? We heard you guys have been looking for us and totally unrelated. We just happen to be halfway across the country. Don't you just hate it when that happens. But you know, as soon as we heard you guys needed to speak with us, we came right back. You're welcome. We have nothing to hide. And police are like, cool, 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 cool. Can we take a look at those shoes, Mr. Panitz? Sick sketchers, by the way. And Ralph's like, absolutely, my guy. Here you go. So he hands over his shoes, not knowing that police had a perfect bloody shoe print that they'd recovered from the scene that just so happened to match Ralph's sketchers that he'd worn while killing Nancy, that for some reason he was still wearing four days later, even though he'd had ample time to dispose of them while he was on the run. But instead, he not only kept them, but he had the balls to wear them into the police station to be questioned about the murder that he'd committed while wearing those exact same shoes. Idiot. And just by giving the shoes a brief once over, they were able to determine that there was in fact blood caked into the soles of Ralph's Skechers. I don't know why I'm so fixated on the fact that they're Skechers, but for some reason to me, that just sounds like the most ridiculous, like up to no good shoe. I thought that only dads wore Skechers while they were doing yard work, but apparently they can be versatile beyond even my wildest imagination. And on top of Ralph's bloody dad shoes, his DNA was also recovered from under Nancy's fingernails during her autopsy. Ralph was subsequently charged with first degree murder to which He pled not guilty. His trial took place in March of 2002 with the prosecution arguing that Ralph had snapped following the court ruling in Nancy's favor regarding the house and the restraining order that given the forensic evidence and the fact that he was really the only one with any motive to wanna hurt Nancy, that he was clearly responsible for her death. And the defense argued that Ralph didn't do it. You think, um, (laughs) you think it took him long to come up with that? To be fair, it wasn't that rudimentary, but it might as well have been. Ralph's lawyer, Jeffrey Feiger, who sidebar also represented Jack Kevorkian, otherwise known as Dr. Death. So he was certainly no stranger to high profile cases. And as far as he was concerned, it was unrealistic to think that Ralph, while quote, deliriously drunk, could have fought Nancy, tried to clean up the blood, locked the house from the inside, barricaded the front door, and left the house without leaving any fingerprints and without being seen by anyone. Instead, Mr. Feiger had deduced that Nancy had likely died from a heart attack while fighting with someone. Not Ralph though, just someone. They, um, They found Ralph guilty of second degree murder, which is shocking, I know. The courtroom was absolutely packed to the rafters on March 27th when Ralph was due to be sentenced. But ironically, Ralph himself 
was not present. He actually refused to attend his sentencing hearing and instead discovered his fate via a TV screen in a private room at the Sarasota County Judicial Center. Judge Nancy Donnellan spoke with obvious disgust in her voice as she held up a crime scene photo of Nancy and delivered Ralph's sentence, stating, quote, Ralph Panitz, this is how she died. I sentence you to the only just sentence in this case, life in prison without the possibility of parole, unquote. She then went on to condemn the Jerry Springer show as well, stating, quote, Ralph Panitz, Eleanor Panitz, and Nancy Campbell were brought to Chicago by the Jerry Springer show, then manipulated by producers of that show. Are ratings more important than the dignity of human life? Shame on you, unquote. When asked to comment on the situation, Jerry himself told a Sarasota reporter, quote, It's my name on the show, but what do I know about it? It sounds awful, but I don't know the people. I show up, I do the show, I have no idea who they are, unquote. Yikes. Nancy's son Jeffrey actually tried to sue the Jerry Springer show, saying that the show's producers intentionally escalated the animosity between Ralph and Nancy. And his lawyers initially predicted a win of upwards of $25 million. But about six months after they filed the suit, they dropped it and settled for nothing. And they did this following a ruling from a Michigan court regarding the Jenny Jones murder case. If you don't know, in March of 1995, the Jenny Jones show, which was considered like a tabloid-esque talk show, taped an episode in which they invited people on to confess their love to someone they'd been admiring from afar. And one of the guys that was invited on actually ended up killing his secret admirer three days later. And even though initially the victim's family won a wrongful death suit against the show, the verdict was subsequently overturned with the Michigan Appeals Court stating basically that the show was not responsible for the guest's safety once they'd left the show. And once that verdict was overturned, Jeffrey's lawyers realized that likely they weren't going to win and ultimately the suit was dropped. As for Ellie, she was given immunity from prosecution in exchange for her cooperation in answering detectives' questions. So she was never formally charged with anything in relation to Nancy's death, although lots of people think that she was for sure involved. After Ralph's guilty verdict came down, Ellie stated in an interview that they didn't agree with the verdict, they didn't think the trial was fair, and that she expected the verdict would be overturned and that Ralph would get a new trial. But... Here we are, 22 and a half-ish years later, and Ralph Panitz remains incarcerated at the DeSoto Correctional Institute in Arcadia, Florida, to this day. He and Ellie are still married. Her Facebook page boasts that she is a proud prison wife. It's also filled with pictures of she and Ralph, whom she affectionately refers to as Wolfie. Okay. According to an episode of Prison Wives that featured her story, she visits him every weekend. She gets up in the middle of the night, drives to the prison, and then sleeps in her car on the side of the road until visitation opens. I guess, at least at the time the episode filmed, the prison only allowed a certain number of visitors on visitation days, so people would drive up and sleep in their cars in line to ensure they make the cut. You gotta do what you gotta do, I guess. And, um, yeah, that's basically it. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. As always, I thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video and to listen to this story. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notifications. I put out new videos every week and I'd love to catch you back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys. Oof, that is not great. New year, same hormonal acne. I am struggling. That's pink. Throws a wrap. Bummer. Apparently, they. Pan it.